Okay, welcome everyone. It's 401 if you're here for the Seeing Lost Enclaves event with Innovator in Residence Jeffrey Warren, hosted by the Library of Congress. You're in the right spot. We're going to start with a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll turn it over to Jeff for the main event. So first, um, we just wanted to say that we're so excited to do this. This is um, the first national event to celebrate Jeff's work uh, that he's been doing in the past year and before, but specifically as innovator in residence. So this really feels like a celebration today. And we're really hoping that this will be fun, that everyone will engage, um, and it'll be a chance to um, uh, honor all the work that Jeff's done with communities. So I want to start just by sharing that this event is being recorded. We'd like to make it available for folks who could not attend. We're going to post it publicly on the labs.lock.gov um, slash events website. Um, and it will probably also be posted on YouTube. So I just wanna share that by continuing to be in this meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Um, keep that in mind, um, uh, especially you know, if you'd like to rename yourself, et cetera, et cetera, to protect your anonymity. Live audio captioning has been turned on for this event. You can control whether you see it or not in your Zoom setting. Um, I said before, we really encourage your engagement. Please use emojis, put comments in the chat during the virtual visit, during Jeff's talk. You can also use hashtag seeing lost enclaves on social, me social media, on Instagram or Twitter, if you wanna have a side conversation on social media. Um, we would though prefer that folks, if you have actual um, questions for Jeff to address during the Q&A, that you put those in the Q&A feature. Um, in Zoom. It's just easier for us to keep track of it and to make sure that we can highlight specific questions. Be mindful of your mute button. Um, this is set up as a meeting so that we could have, you know, full participation from folks, but we will be helping people to mute um, if we found that they've come off mute accidentally. And then lastly, if you're experiencing technical issues during this event, please reach out to me, Jamie, uh, directly um, uh, in the chat or, you know, put a general uh, chat in that you're having problems and my colleague Sahar or I will assist you. Okay, so with that housekeeping, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff for a couple comments before we get started. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so today we'll be visiting a sensitive space, uh, one which has experienced erasure uh, for this and other reasons. We're not treating it as a, a tourist visit, but as a way to show respect for this community. And of course, we want this to be a safe and respectful event for everyone attending today. So uh, please refrain from using offensive or derogatory language, and please exercise care in how you conduct yourself in the space with these histories in mind. You're welcome to use the chat, but inappropriate commenters will be given a warning and ultimately removed in accordance with the library's comment and, po uh, and posting policy. And please consider giving space for Asian American attendees to share and reflect, as well as for members of other communities of color who have experienced erasure. Okay, so I'm gonna say uh, a couple of words uh, really fa fast before we hand it over to Jeff for the, um, the main course. So uh, I'm Jamie Mears. I work um, at the Library of Congress. I'm a senior innovation specialist on the LC Labs team, um, and I lead the Innovator in Residence program. So I just wanted to start by saying that on behalf of LC Labs and my colleagues at the library, I think some of my colleagues are actually here today, um, we want to say welcome. Um, and we're so glad you're here. Uh, I know that everyone at the Library of Congress uh, wants to see our collections reach people. Um, and we love it when people come into the building and we love that we have you know, so many visitors to our website every year and people come to events. But we also know that um, it's really just scratching the surface given the types of um, opportunities that technology has given us, um, the fact that the library is going more and more um, you know, virtual in our offerings and our programming and the fact that we're one of the largest libraries in the world, um, there's just so much that we know that we could do to help um, serve you all um, in the general public. And so 
with each innovator in residence um, that we engage, we get to work with someone who has a vision for what more we could possibly be as uh, the nation's library. And the cool part is that uh, their vision is never actually about the Library of Congress. It's about a specific community that they're trying to serve and that they see that there's some type of um, good in connecting that community to history in some way, to 3D's materials in some way. Um, and that's really, I think, what makes the program um, so special and so relevant year after year. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of past innovators. Um, this is our fifth year um, hosting an innovator in residence program. And if you'd like to see some examples of some of their past work, you can um, check out a link that Sahar is going to share um, with all of their free to use um, uh, works up online. Okay. And so with that, it's my honor to represent the 2023-2024 Innovator in Residence, Jeffrey Warren. He is an artist and educator whose artistic practice investigates how people build identity and strength through their interactions and artifacts and histories, and the ways that objects can tell stories that people, people can be part of in the present. So if you're attending this, and you've had the privilege of collaborating with Jeff in the past um, or learning from him or experiencing his work, um, you'll know then that he exemplifies care. Uh, care as an artist, care in all things, but especially in his practice, caring for the stories of Asian Americans today and those that came before, teaching workshops on the possibilities of what someone can do with a single photograph of an ancestor, learning how to build a hanok by hand or recreate his mother's memory of a snowy day in Seoul. I encourage you to check out his Instagram account at Unterbahn for a portfolio of examples um, of his larger memory craft. This is just a piece of a lot of the um, things that he's doing with his prolific practice. So in this particular case of relational reconstruction of uh, lost enclaves, like the one you're going to see today, this is a project that is about caring and the extreme careful work that it takes to spend hours and hours as a Korean American, as an artist, looking through white-centered archives for news clippings, for business listings, for the corner of a building at the edge of a photograph to illustrate a once vibrant Chinatown like the one um, from Providence where um, Jeff currently lives. So to persist and piece these parts of an archive together and then give them back to a community as an embodied experience of care goes beyond and sometimes in spite of what an archive can do. So we're honored to support artists like Jeffrey in this work to reimagine how the library can connect to all Americans and so honored that you guys could be with us here to experience this work. So now um, it's a pleasure um, to hand it over to Innovator in Residence, Jeffrey Warren. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and um, that means I, I won't be able to see folks comments, but we'll be circling back during the Q&A portion. Um, so, let me know if anything comes up more immediately than that. Um, all right. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about, a little bit about myself and how I well about how I got into this project to to start with. Um, it in a sense started way back in 2018 um, when uh, I was walking around uh, where I live in Providence and came across a plaque from uh, a project at Brown, uh, the Rhode Island Chinese History Project um, by Angela Fang, Julianne Fontana, John Eng Wong, and Bob Lee and, and others. They had really done a huge amount of uh, archival research into um, Providence's Chinatown, which uh, I learned right there existed in the neighborhood and really on the block that I live on. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it was a, sur a surprise to me, as it is to many people, that there was a Chinatown there. And they were able to find 
just these three pictures um, of uh, what it what it had looked like. Uh, you know, a couple of them on the right side, not not very good fidelity, uh, hard to really make out um, too much what we're seeing. But even the third bigger picture, I really felt challenged to know what I was even looking at, like where what direction I was facing, uh, anything like that, and um, and so uh, I really began to get drawn into um, this history through these photos. And I, I began to be kind of uh, super interested in finding more pictures. I, one of the very first things that I did as I was starting to get into this work um, was to take that picture. And I eventually did figure out what direction it was looking. And I, I just did this really crude Photoshop to just try to see what it would have looked like, you know, overlaid onto a street today. Um, and, um, and as, you know, months and, and even years went on, I, I started to really deeply familiarize myself with all the little details and features of this neighborhood, both before and after it was destroyed in 1914. Um, and to start to pick out like the front of this billboard is the back of that billboard or this, this interestingly shaped window matches that one to sort of place these images um, both historically, but also in my own mind. And I began to, you know, be able to sort of picture the buildings in the neighborhood as I walked around, um, these blocks today. And I began to wonder, you know, if there were enough photos to create a kind of a model, um, you know, to, to be able to experience sort of walking down the street, um, and um, I was really intensely curious, not only what it had looked like, but what it might have felt like to be there. Uh, and I, I kind of did this quick uh, proof of concept. And I was encouraged and I began really collecting images more rigorously, tracing where each photo was taken, um, you know, what year it was from, and just trying to get as much information about this, uh, this little neighborhood as, as possible. Um, and uh, and you know began to get other glimpses of these streets and these buildings um, and and very occasionally of people um, and along the way I was very uh, privileged to well to meet John Engwong who was one of the original team that that worked on this and, and has been a scholar of this community and, and um, you know its histories for for decades uh, and we we share a, a love of you know going to archives and, and finding things and learning more of these histories and also uh irene luke hope on the right uh who is the archivist of beneficent church um and who has uh herself done a, a huge amount of work in um preserving community history through old records um in this area as a descendant of uh provinces uh chinese american uh community uh and of chinatown so um, yeah, it's been, uh, uh, a really powerful journey and, uh, I began, you know, really finding a lot of photos, including some from the Providence Journal and other newspapers, uh, and, and approaching what I felt like was a, a relatively complete, um, collection of all the different buildings in the neighborhood, uh, and, and, and piecing them together into a model, uh, in, in a process that I began to call relational reconstruction. Um, and I, I've made it a goal um, to try to provide a space of connection with these histories, uh, not so much a, like a, a diorama or, or a trip to a fascinating place, but but really more, um, you know, knowing what, what it's like to be Asian American on these streets today, more of an interest in knowing more deeply a little bit of what it might have been like for a member of this community, which began so many of the stories we're part of today. Um, that meant that although much of the imagery I found was very disturbing and, and racist, the job um, I've set for myself was to try to reconnect with these histories as Asian Americans and to do so experientially and even creatively. Um, but yeah, I'm going to switch over to this model and um, bear with me for a moment. Sure, the sound is on.
Can you all hear that? Not yet. Oh, let me uh, press that other button that we found. How's that? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Glad we found that button. Okay. Welcome. Um, we're going to be visiting a moment in the history of Providence from between 1904 to 1914, when this part of Providence was an enclave and to some degree a safe space for the earliest Asian American community in Rhode Island, Providence's second Chinatown. In this video, we'll be visiting this space virtually through this reconstruction of the neighborhood, which I've crafted. And I'll be addressing primarily Asian American visitors in my narration because we are the primary audience for this work. The challenge in reconnecting to this place is partly in how we each relate to this community. Of course, we want to avoid a sense of tourism, of exoticism, and we also know that these histories have many layered meanings to all Asian Americans and Asian diaspora who live in the area today. And those meanings aren't all focused on the displacement and discrimination that occurred. As Asian Americans, we have as much or more to learn from the warmer moments. In this visit, remember that connection or reconnection doesn't always happen through words or images. I'll be sharing about the history we know, but try to make some time for your other senses as well and for your imagination. The doors we find in our own memories and family histories are more powerful than those we find in the archives. Mozilla Hubs is a multi-person environment, uh, and that's the environment that I've built this model in. And although attendees will be viewing through my eyes, as you can see, rather than navigating the space yourselves, a few collaborators and previous workshop participants have joined within the space today and will be accompanying us for the visit. Uh, you may see them within the environment as, uh, as bird avatars. Um, so it, that's, that's what you'll see, or that's what's going on if you see birds in the space. Uh, thanks to Jasmine, John, and Aiden for joining us in this way. Let me see. I actually don't see them around right now, but I think they'll be with us. Okay, so first, um, I'd like to ask you to take a deep breath and to listen to the sounds of the street. Think about the sounds that might have been the same 120 years ago. Let's travel back to 1914. You're near the site of Providence's Empire Street Chinatown, walking up Westminster Street towards the edge of downtown. It's raining gently and the streets are empty. Ahead is the intersection with Empire Street, across from the familiar entr entrance to the Empire Theater. Turning the corner, the street is far smaller than it is in 2023, and it's a mix of dirt and round stones under your feet. The curb is taller, the sidewalks narrower than Providence today. You glance over your shoulder, but it seems like you're alone as you look ahead and see the Anlyang Merchants Association building ahead in the gloom. You exhale. The distant sound of a trolley clangs as you approach the warm glow of the grocery store front you know so well. You think of the owner, Mr. Kwong, who you can picture looking up to smile at you as you enter, a bell jingling as the door swings open. Mr. Tao has brought in freshly grown radishes from his farm just outside of town, much better than the bedraggled ones that come in from Boston.
Next door, you can smell the food wafting out from the doorway, maybe the smell of crisping hot oil or simmering soup, the murmur of voices. Around back, the narrow alley opens onto the kitchen, but you don't go in because you've already eaten and you know they won't let you go without a hot bowl of, what is it? You picture the dish in your mind, its aromas bringing you back to a childhood memory. You duck back out into the rain for a moment to cross over to the looming three-story building where the Onleong headquarters is. You pass through a shop crowded with shelves of homewares and dry goods. You climb briskly up the narrow stairs to the third floor where your room overlooks the street. Slipping off your shoes, you approach the window. You can hear a neighbor plucking a string instrument and down on the street below, you see a cat jump gingerly down from the wall next to the pharmacy, picking, picking its way between puddles. You close your curtain and get ready for bed. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we saw during the visit, but outside of the immersive context of Chinatown. For starters, um, the Empire Theater, which you see here, was in the model. Uh, it's the street. It's it's what Empire Street was named for, and it was torn down the same year, 1914, as uh, Chinatown. Uh, this is a view of the street today from where the entrance to the Empire Theater would have been. Uh, and folks who know Providence might recognize the Providence Public Library in the distance, um, as well as uh, where AS220 Community Art Space is uh, about halfway down the block. Um, here's the same angle in the model in the environment that you were just in. And you can see there's a kind of a collage quality of the photos that make up the buildings. Um, some of them are, uh, a few of them are contemporary photos, but most of them are from a mix of different time periods. Um, and I, I want to know, I mentioned this is the sort of the second Providence Chinatown. Um, in some ways, it's a continuation of the first, which was on Burrell Street, uh, about a half block uh, behind us uh, from this view. Um, each of the buildings was made up of real images of the neighborhood, uh, but some of them, uh, the fidelity of the images was so poor that um, uh, I occasionally would do this kind of um, stitching together of pieces uh, to make up a, a facade. So in this case, this is the Anliang Merchants Association building, uh, where I had a really good picture of the side of the building, but not of the front. Uh, and so I was able to use pieces of the side to kind of rebuild the front um, in order to um, bring it to life a little bit more crisply. And you may have noticed um, a number of the buildings like the grocery, pharmacy, and restaurant uh, that we went into first had a halftone pattern. Um, and that's because those uh, buildings are only visible in photographs published in, uh, in the newspaper, the Providence Journal. So um, in a lot of cases, I left the halftone pattern there, um, partly to show the kind of erasure that's represented visually in the environment. Um, but also I felt that the texturing, it didn't really uh, 
significantly prevent us from experiencing it as a space. And so um, I was sort of selective in, in which buildings I chose to bring to a higher resolution. Uh, another thing that's true is that there's very few pictures of people. Uh, I think that's it's because the photography uh, photographers were mostly white and didn't have a relationship with, or at least not a good relationship with members of the community. Um, there are some portraits and uh, family photos that Irene Luke Hope has um, stewarded at the Beneficent Archives. But for the most part, these are the kinds of glimpses we might get of the interiors. And some of these pictures inspired the, the narration that uh, that you heard, uh, like the scenes from a kitchen or a restaurant. Uh, these were probably on Burrell Street, uh, half a block away, uh, the, these photographs from the Providence Journal. And one thing that I noticed a lot was not only do we have very few interior photos, but there are, is, it's very rare to see a view of the neighborhood from the inside of a building. And I think that gets at that um, you know, uh, bias in the, the archival, uh, you know, views, the sort of photographer's gaze, the white gaze of the, uh, of the documentation we have. And by making a model of this kind, we are able to kind of try to reverse that and to get these very special views looking out from a bedroom window or, a, or a, an office window onto the street, um, which is something I, I, um, really appreciate about this process. Um, I also wanted to mention a few ongoing collaborations uh, that have been part of this work, one with uh, Dree Chu Tattersfield, uh, who I've been working on a model of the uh, Portland Chinese Vegetable Gardens. Um, and Dree and I also did this uh, collaboration very recently to produce a, a paper zine um, of the neighborhood where we also tried to represent that same view out a window, uh, and we try to draw the reader in uh, interactively into the scene. Um, and uh, it's hard to represent this in, a, in photos here, but uh, we'll be announcing this zine pretty shortly. And uh, it has uh, really a full paper model of the neighborhood that you can really kind of get into and experience in a way uh, uh, more tactily and uh, more narratively. Um, so yeah, look out for that on my Instagram, hopefully in the next week. Um, I also, really have used creative means to get into the stories and um, to provide kind of an alternative to uh, just a historic or archival view. Uh, and I, I draw the neighborhood a lot and I try to understand it through drawing. Um, and I also have a kind of a long-term goal of writing a picture book about the neighborhood uh, and really centering more narrative approaches to happenings in the neighborhood. I've storyboarded out parts of this. So someday, uh, someday, hopefully. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, after many, many months of design and planning and collaboration with uh, uh, collaborators Vic and Vuti, we recently did a community memory event on the site of Provinces Chinatown, where um, it was designed around the kind of uh, feeling of a street food environment um, where we served hot food from the Chin families, Charlie Chin and Chanel Chin, uh, who are descendants of, of Providence's Chinatown, uh, from their restaurant, Asia Grill in Lincoln. And we um, uh, had people join us and experience not only kind of uh, seeing archival photos and, and uh, doing activities, uh, in relation to them, but also we uh, created a VR experience. And rather than using VR headsets as they are, we crafted a set of masks. Here you can see there's an ox, uh, uh, a dragon, and a tiger mask, within which are VR um, uh, cardboard headsets. Um, so these uh, participants are uh, immersed in a scene uh, from the Burl Street Chinatown, and we incorporated audio, uh, oral history, and uh, narration as well on site. And that was really special. Um, I wanted to also mention that um, I have already been hosting uh, a lot of workshops uh, to um, invite people, especially Asian American folks, to um, 
participate and to, to try their own relational reconstructions based in either archival photographs of, uh, you know, folks, uh, or, uh, ways of connecting with, um, your ancestry, uh, or family photographs. Um, and this is an example of one that I made using a photo of a, a child during the Korean War reading some comic books on a fence. And this is one of the earliest ones I made. And you can see how I, it, it's a much more collaged, uh, rougher process, but it, uh, the idea is to sort of extend the textures out of the original image, uh, to make, uh, a, a kind of an environment that, that, uh, that I can immerse myself within, um, to sort of feel that I'm there with, uh, this kid. And, uh, that kind of practice is, is something I'll be hosting a lot more workshops on. Uh, I've been calling it ancestral memory enclaves, and it's sort of the very first step in a more, a deeper relational reconstruction um, uh, methodology or process. Uh, and these workshops will make up part of the toolkit, which we're we're announcing today. Uh, and there will be a link that you can learn more about this. And there are some online guides and and videos and documentation uh, to um, invite you know members of the public to to do relational reconstruction. And that's it for my comments. Uh, I did want to uh, quickly thank um, the Rhode Island Chinese History Project that I mentioned in the very, very, very first slide. Um, organizations like AS220, the uh, Providence Public Library, Movement Education Outdoors, uh, the City of Providence's Arts, Culture, and Tourism Department, um, descendants of uh, Providence, Providence's Chinatown who I've been able to work with uh, in this um, project and uh, other organizations who have been helping and supporting this work. Uh, and of course, the Library of Congress and the uh, Innovator in Residence program. Um, and I also just wanted to shout out and thank my collaborators, Vic, Vuti, Dri, who you saw in the earlier slides, but also Alicia Renee Ball, and Chen, Aidan Choi, and others. Um, and finally, to folks like Linda Sue Park and Sadia Hartman, who have really theorized and prototyped these powerful ideas of speculative history and critical fabulation, uh, in the case of City of Hartman, um, in the face of partial and sometimes traumatic archival history. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen, and I think we're going to go to some Q and A. Is, is that right? Yes, that's right. We've had a couple so far. Oh, I think we have an echo. Thanks. Um, so there's just a couple of general questions that we got first to start out before some of the specific questions that are in the chat. Um, oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, text me. Okay, so we will start with the ones in the chat. So the first one we got um, was from Kari, uh, Herbie Lentz, and she or they are asking what software was used to build the model, and also is there a public version available? And um, an attendee named Birkin put in a link to Hubs, which is correct, but I didn't know if you wanted to say any more about that to uh, Kari's question. Sure, and I think, uh, oh yeah, that's the other thing I wanted to do is show the toolkit itself. I forgot to actually, I have that open in a tab. Uh, so maybe that's a good opportunity um, to do that. Um, I'll just share my screen again real quickly. Um, yeah, so the, the toolkit, which I mentioned, um, this is the sort of front page. It has an introductory video and it really goes very in depth on I don't. I won't say too in depth, but it goes very into a lot of detail about the process, um, not only uh, modeling but also the research process, the sound, and in some cases, I collaborated with other artists uh, to produce some of these. So um, uh, I'll just briefly show, like uh, you know, mapping the mapping process and how maps play a role in the work. Uh, there's also the modeling portion, getting at, at the question. Um, uh, where I show, I actually use SketchUp a lot to produce initial models. It's a um, very easy to use program. Uh, but, um, and then I move things into Mozilla Hubs. Uh, I'll use Blender a little bit, uh, which is um, open source and free to use. Uh, but there, are, you know, you can, 
I do think you can really use the uh, software of your choice um, uh, as long as it can produce the file format that Mozilla Hubs will will read. But but yeah, the documented process I have, I used SketchUp and um, and then I, uh, you know, you can sort of see how I use images within there. And then at some point I, I bring it all into Mozilla Hubs and, uh, and, then that, and then I add lighting and things like that. Um, I will just briefly show a couple shots from, there's a chapter or a section in the, this toolkit um, on atmosphere. Uh, and I worked with Alicia Renee Ball, who's a amazing artist. Um, and Alicia shows really step-by-step -step how uh, she has used Blender and a lot of the lighting, uh, lighting tools and sort of environmental um, uh, techniques like fog and all kinds of stuff to, to create um, emotional tone and depth in the models. And that's been a big inspiration for me and my work. And then also there's a section which I did in collaboration with Han Chen, uh, an artist who um, uh, works a lot in historical soundscapes um, and uh, crafting of historical soundscapes. So that the steps uh, go step by step through not only the process of kind of a deep listening uh, in photos, but also uh, kind of reconstructing the sounds that might have been in those photos and then also embedding those images or sorry those those uh, sounds within Mozilla hubs to create the kind of spatialized sound that you heard during uh, during our visit and there was a question from Kari just to follow up about whether the Relational reconstruction environment hubs that you showed is publicly available. Uh, yeah, um, the environments will be. I think quite shortly. We're uh, trying to figure out the best way to to share them. I think they are actually online al already, but uh, but yeah, very shortly we will. And the other thing is we'll have uh, videos of um, uh, this something very close to the visit that you just had, as well as one to the Portland uh, Chinese Vegetable Gardens uh, that I did in collaboration with uh, Dree Chu Tattersfield. Uh, and, and for updates uh, and uh, when those uh, are posted, um, you can uh, follow us uh, at the experiments page that uh, has been linked a couple times, as well as I'll be uh, you know sharing it out on my Instagram as well. So there's some questions in the chat and some questions in Q&A. We're going to jump over to Q&A um, for a bit. So first one is from an anonymous participant. How did you make decisions about interior spaces, such as floor plan, and whether or not to furnish them? Thank you. Yeah, you, you may have noticed that a lot of the interiors in the uh, model are, are relatively empty. And... I've taken different approaches to this over time. Um, I think the first thing that I thought about was because there are so few pictures of interiors, the interiors would be much more speculative than the exteriors. The exteriors, I think, are relatively true in size and texture and things to, to how they were. Um, and so um, I have been more careful about the interiors. Uh, I also felt that um, apart from just the furnishings, it, it was um, challenging to think of a respectful way to represent people with without actual photos of the people who would have been in there. I mean, the few photos we have are mostly either uh, kind of a bit out of context, like they're grainy, like the newspaper ones, um, or uh, they're, they're seated portraits, and uh, so that would be a little tough to kind of weave into a, an interior scene that would feel kind of normal and not posed. Um, so there are challenges like that. Um, I tried to represent the presence of people through the warmth of the spaces, through lighting, um, kind of referring, you know, uh, getting at some of the work I've done with Alicia. And then finally, I've also hosted workshops where uh, I've invited uh, you know, mostly Asian American workshop participants to 
look to their own uh, family histories that may have parallels or, or uh, connection to um, these histories in order to uh, speculatively imagine what the interiors were like. And we, we have had workshops where people, you know, I remember one person grew up working in a family restaurant and uh, reconstructing the inside of the restaurant as a speculative uh, interior that felt, um, you know, true to uh, the spirit of the space, even if it, you know, wasn't based on a photograph of that specific interior uh, or someone else who um, uh, created a, 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 an environment around uh, an altar scene uh, uh, from a family photo of themselves at the age of, I think, 11 or 12 uh, with their, their aunt at, a, at an ancestral altar. And then it, it turns out there's actually a photograph of um, an altar uh, from Providence's Chinatown in an old newspaper, one of the very few photos we have of an interior. And it was really interesting to see the reconstructed memory enclave from the workshop uh, alongside this um, you know, historic photo of, a, of an altar and see the commonalities. So yeah, we've, I've been taking different approaches to it, but I think that's another thing that I hope to go uh, more deeply into in the coming year. Jamie, would you like me to just uh, scroll down the comments and pick one out, or yeah, I'm also. If you want to, follow. to Sahar and I were just talking and saying maybe we should go through the Q and A's first. I think that might be easier because we've selected those, and then we can move to the chat. And you are muted. Uh, good. I get to try again. <laughs> uh, all right. I just opened up the Q and A. Thank you. Um, and uh, so uh, Dr. Xiao from the Library of Congress's Asian Division asked uh, about uh, what cities will be kind of like uh, in the plan, I, I think coming up uh, in the coming year. Uh, so I mentioned briefly Portland's Chinese Vegetable Gardens, which is I think a really interesting one that Dri Chu Tattersfield has led and, and I've been collaborating uh, on. And um, uh, that's an interesting one because it's technically within the limits of the city of Portland, but it really is almost a rural scene. It's a farm um, that is in uh, what is now West Portland. Uh, that's one that you will be able to see very shortly as we share some videos uh, and documentation around. Um, but I also um, am looking forward to visiting a few other sites. I'm, I'm interested in places like um, Riverside, California, where there was both a, a Chinatown and also a, an early Korean American community called Pachapa Camp in, I want to say around 1907 or 1908, if I remember right. Um, and uh, places like Terrace in Utah, where folks have, uh, you know, been uh, uh, remembering histories of a, a whole town that's now gone, but there are still um, artifacts and uh, places sort of to the northwest of uh, Great Salt Lake, I think. Um, so places like that that I'm interested in. And I've also been collecting and um, trying to organize just a huge amount of photographs and records from the Library of Congress. And I've been organizing them by uh, region. And that's shared in, um, it's linked to from the research portion of the guide that, um, that we looked at. Uh, yeah, and thank you for the question. Um, I see another person asked about um, the politics from that time period and and uh, whether it, World War I was, uh, you know, uh, the, the politics, sort of the, the current, I guess uh, the current events may have overshadowed the destruction of Providence Chinatown or uh, and asking about if people were compensated or hurt during the process. Um, this, I, it's an interesting question. I have often seen headlines about uh, World War I uh, alongside uh, headlines about uh, Chinatown in the Providence Journal. Um, and so, you know, uh, one thing was uh, newspapers were like really big back then. I mean, physically large. The, the, broad, the broadsheet size or whatever, I, I don't know my newspaper sizes, but, you know, it had like eight columns. Uh, so I, I guess there was just room for a lot of news. I mean, it was really, um, uh, 
so I, I don't feel necessarily that it was because of World War II, but I think that the coverage that the, that existed in the Providence Journal and other local papers was very tilted. It was biased and it was often racist uh, in the way that it covered uh, happenings in the neighborhood. It described Chinatown very often as a criminal place uh, or a place that needed to be, um, you know, uh, needed law enforcement or something like that. Um, so that made it, I think, very challenging to uh, get a real sense of what the community was like and not be influenced by um, by those views. Um, as to whether people were compensated or hurt, I want to say almost certainly not compensated. I've never heard any record of it. There was newspaper coverage of landowners in that area being compensated, but since um, uh, Chinese Americans were on the whole not landowners, and I think uh, I've never heard of uh, folks owning land in um, Empire Street Chinatown. And in fact, during some periods, it may have been uh, prohibited um, on the basis of race. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think there was any compensation. As to whether people were hurt, um, uh, I know that the community was able to kind of reconstitute in a new space uh, about a mile away, uh, west over what is now the highway, although it didn't exist at that time. And, it, and what, continued there for some decades. I don't know uh, that many of the individual stories of, of how people made that transition, but I can't imagine it was easy. Um, and I hope that kind of uh, addresses the next question about erasure and what happened to the community after 1914. Um, there are quite a number of people who remember what people will call the Summer Street or Werner's Lane Chinatown, which is what I mentioned where the community moved across. Um, I will say that also there was on Empire Street, a black American community that was also displaced at the same time. And in the new building where uh, folks from Empire Street Chinatown moved to, that had previously been a black community and they were displaced in a kind of a chain reaction. Um, so there was a lot of people displaced at this time. And I think there were all kinds of harms uh, related to that. So yeah, I, I, a lot of this stuff I've learned from John Engwong, from Irene Luke Hope, who, who has uh, herself childhood memories of seeing the Summer Street Chinatown um, and other descendants in the area. And I think that's the, the main way that, that we learn about, that we today we can learn about um, that, that time period. But most of the memories that people have date back to around the 50s, not all the way into the teens, of course. That's all the questions I see highlighted. I can switch over into the comments. I see Holly has a question. Uh, did you find a lot of information and photos on food or restaurant related items? Um, uh, from my experience, Asian American culture is centered around culinary identities. I, I think that's totally true. Um, there are, it's nice, there are menus in the Rhode Island State Archives. Um, so you can see some of the things that are served there. Um, one contrast I, I think is kind of interesting is I recently was at both uh, Asia Grill and at um, uh, Chen's up in Woonsocket, um, which is a, a historic, uh, bo both of them are, are historic Chinese American restaurants. Um, uh, Chen's dating back, gosh, uh, into the 40s or earlier, I think even earlier. I, I don't have my Chen's history quite right. But uh, interestingly, both menus have... Um, I think it's called like an American food section. Um, I think Asia Grill has only one item on that in that section. And that's interesting to me because when I spoke with Irene Lukope about her memories growing up working in Luke's, the famous, um, locally famous uh, Chinese restaurant downtown, uh, she said they had two separate kitchens, one for Chinese food and one for American food, uh, as they described it at the time, um, American Chinese food and um, kind of meant that they would have you know, two different cuisines. Um, and uh, the what they called American food was sort of uh, like um, steaks and things, I guess, um, white American food. And then Chinese American uh, food was served uh, on from the other kitchen. And there was really two full menus at that time. Uh, and sort of see today's menus that still have kind of a little um, hint of that left over is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, we would see also advertisements uh, in, in the uh, newspapers 
uh, and I know Aaron Castillo, another uh, person who's been really researching early uh, Chinese American history and food history in particular, has found a lot of ads. And, and Aaron found uh, one ad that informed um, the narrative you heard today, which is that on Empire Street was a restaurant called Yik's in, I think it was earlier on, like I want to say 1905 or maybe even earlier. Uh, at that address where I mentioned in the narration, hearing sort of cooking sounds and things. And that's what inspired that part of it. Thank you for the question. I'm going to pass this to Jeff, Jeff because one of these got skipped. Uh, some, someone put in, um, can you talk about the erasure? So what happened to this community after 1914 and how did you come across it? Uh, thanks for unmuting me. Uh, I see. I, I think I actually tried to address that in, in talking about the Werner Street Chinatown, uh, which is where folks moved to after uh, Empire Street Chinatown was uh, was torn down. So, um, and I mean, I could speak a little more on how I learned about it. I It's documented to some degree in the Providence Journal. Uh, I learned a lot from John Engwong, who has studied uh, the histories of Providence's Chinatowns for a long time. And... Um, uh, and just in terms of, you know, what I was mentioning about descendants with memories of the Summer Street Chinatown or Werner's Lane Chinatown, that's where I've learned the most about what that Chinatown was like, although a little bit further forward in the 50s. Maybe you want me to just, sorry, you have it. Okay. Sorry, maybe I can just scroll ahead a little bit and and pick out a few um, pictures here or uh, questions here. Uh, is there a reason why it's rainy and dark in the rendering? Yeah, um, I have made a daytime rendering, um, and I, I also like it. Uh, I think I'll, I have a dream of someday making a snow like a blizzard or a snow day rendering, but the weather and the lighting for me are part of um, developing a sense of place and an emotional connection with places. Uh, uh, so I, I try to think of them as warm, inviting places that it's nice to get inside out of the rain. And in some of the visits that um, I have hosted where people have, have gone into the neighborhood in Mozilla Hubs, folks have even said that they felt like warmer stepping off the street into a building um, because of some of the atmospheric effects. Uh, but, but yeah, it's not the only way that I represent the neighborhood. It's just one that I happen to like, and I think is a pretty evocative, uh, evocative one, but it's, it's a very good question. Um, the Portland Chinese, uh, vegetable gardens model is a daytime model. Um, and it, it comes with a lot of challenges because you can see further, um, you have to fill, uh, a lot more space. Uh, it's also a much more it's not a narrow alley, that, that particular community. And so you have to model a lot more. And uh, uh, yeah, and in that model, I was telling Jamie earlier, we've tried to put in something like 20,000 plants, uh, which is its own whole project. And it creates a, some, some chaos in the model. Uh, but you know, if you're gonna model a farm on a hillside surrounded by a forest, then you, know, you have to uh, dig into it um, quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, you know, we're relying a lot on, I think, you know, essentially video game technologies here. And, and luckily they're, they're up to probably a lot more than, than I'm pushing the envelope uh, in the models that I've made. Although occasionally it will sort of skip and, and have trouble with things if I had like too many lights or something like that. But yeah, thank you. Let me see. Uh, I see people are pointing out there are a lot of other uh, interesting places where there are Chinatowns and yeah, it's been, uh, maybe I can link to the, the page where I compiled up. Well, I'll see if I can pull that later, but, um, but yeah, there's a, a big spreadsheet where I have compiled a lot of, uh, resources from the library of Congress about different Chinatowns around the U S and, um, uh, as well as some resources outside the library of Congress and, uh, yeah, I, I'm always uh, interested to learn about new places where there have been uh, not just Chinatowns, but other early Asian American communities and other communities of color that that um, it would be interesting to do this work in. Um, yeah, I, and I'll say also, um, 
Oh yeah, I see someone mentions uh, um, uh, the Marie Rose Wong book on Portland's uh, Chinatown, which is a, a big source for Dree and my my work there. I would say, yeah, one thing that's um, an important part of uh, my process is uh, if I'm working in a new place, I'm really seeking to develop a partnership with people who either live there today or who uh, have a personal connection to that place. So sometimes, you know, perhaps a descendant of a community that's no longer there or uh, someone who, uh, you know, like in, 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 in the case of Dree True Tattersfield, Dree uh, went to, I think, high school in Portland at, uh, and uh, Dries High School was on the site of the Portland Chinese Vegetable Gardens. So that was a big surprise to Dree and, and, and uh, was one of the inspirations for choosing that site. Uh, so yeah, if there are folks uh, who are, uh, who have that kind of relationship personally to a space, please do reach out and I'd love to, uh, you know, figure out a, a ways to collaborate or to support uh, a project to do reconstruction there. Uh, I'm going to switch back to Q and A because I see there's a few more in there. Oh, great! Um, question from Dai Gao. Um, thank you. And um, how do I see this work influencing current placekeeping and placemaking efforts in living Chinatowns? That's such a great question. Thank you. Uh, well, first, I mean not just in living Chinatowns, but it, like in Providence, we have so many communities which are experiencing displacement today um, that are, you know, communities of color. Uh, and so I, I, I see what we learn about Providence's Chinatown and the sort of environment and uh, circumstances historically, socially, uh, culturally, and politically around that as very much about today's uh, uh, displacements and uh, and so you know, I hope that by doing this work and engaging in it, we you know we learn about the ways we want to be in the present. Um, but yeah, I, I I have a lot of admiration for a lot of the hard work that goes on in in present day Chinatowns as well to uh, continue and preserve them. And uh, I'll you know mention inspirations I've had. Uh, you know, Wing on Well Project has done incredible work uh, in. in um, uh, preserving oral histories and working with uh, elders and uh, engaging in creative practices, um, many others as well. I think there's a project uh, Siagi in, in the Bay Area that's uh, doing work with uh, Korean American elders and stories. So there's just so many uh, projects that which I've been very inspired by in my work. And um, yeah, I aspire, you know, to to collaborate with in the future, I hope. Um, because I think that, you know, we, that's why this has to be a creative, a, a, a project that is not just historical, but is also creative because these have to be living histories and we have to be engaging them in ways that aren't just uh, writing everything down sort of in a sense before it's gone, but we have to be making new meanings from them and deciding how we want to live in the future um, based on what we, we can learn from these histories. Uh, and I see uh, Mia... Cariello, uh, I hope I didn't mispronounce that. Um, what, if any, hiccups or bumps did you encounter while trying to craft the project's script, particularly using or being inspired by Hartman's critical fabulation? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. I, I was, so you may have noticed that I, I stopped at one point and I didn't fill in the blank on what exactly was the food that you might have um, recognized. Um, because uh, I don't, it's actually less that I don't, I mean, it is true that I don't know that all of us could call to mind the smells of a particular dish, especially from that era's, uh, you know, American Chinese foods or, or, or what, we may not know what was served in a restaurant that, that catered primarily to residents of Chinatown, as opposed to ones where we have English language menus in say the Rhode Island Historical Society. But the other part of that is um, that I really want um, not just to speculate, but to invite um, visitors and especially Asian American visitors to, to participate in, 
in that speculation and in that critical fabulation. So that was a challenge in part because I, you know, I think inspired by collaborating with Dree to Tattersfield, I've been incorporating more narrative, more um, kind of uh, interactivity into the work, but pushing it beyond just, you know, what do you hear? What do you see? But to really anchor that experience in a very specific memory in the listener's mind. Um, and that's tapping into a connection to history and to ancestry that is going to be different in different people's minds and is something that I can't even necessarily evoke specifically for someone. Uh, so that that was, I think, a really interesting challenge and, and I hope, uh, you know, an interesting moment in, in the narration. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, in general, uh, I can only aspire to, to, to do... Uh, work that is you know as as deep and thoughtful as as city hartman's um and i'm you know uh constantly looking to her to her example and and her as an inspiration so thank you for the question um were there other questions that jamie you wanted to highlight or sahar Oh, there's, more in the yeah, there's one more in the Q and A. Oh, sorry, I keep and there was one in the chat as well. Yeah. Great. Um, anonymous participant asks: In terms of the built environment, has this ongoing research and creating the various models helped you to see major similarities or major differences among Chinatowns? Yeah. Um, one thing is. Um, uh, people sometimes note that the buildings of Providence's Chinatown aren't architecturally recognizable as a Chinatown. And I mean, I have different feelings about that. And um, uh, to me, uh, in a sense, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, like these are the buildings as they were, they were, uh, you know, we can guess that they were precious and familiar and um, important. Um, you know, no matter how they looked, uh, you know, and that's what the streets look like. Um, so, so I think that's a um, one way to understand it. Another is, I think there's a complicated history of how um, uh, different Chinatowns that have created kind of architectural interventions um, have done so to renegotiate their place in a broader city. You know, to present themselves as a a destination, a tourist destination in some cases. And there's some pretty interesting histories you can read about uh, some of the big Chinatowns and, and how that was approached. And, and um, in, in many cases, uh, it was done at a time where it was uh, in order to prevent violence against uh, these communities, uh, to uh, sort of choose to be uh, seen as a destination rather than as a target in a sense. So that, that's part of it. And then there are many other history. I mean, it didn't happen the same way in all different places. Um, and so I think, yeah, it, it's a, it's an interesting thing to dig into, like how that um, how that's worked in different places. But in Providence's Chinatown, for the most part, there weren't that many sort of architectural changes to buildings. And that, that's also related to the fact that in Providence, uh, nobody owned the buildings as, as far as I know, as I mentioned. Um, and so they, they didn't have the permission to make those big changes. Whereas in bigger Chinatowns, uh, and also a little bit later in history, uh, more often uh, folks did own buildings uh, uh, or were legally allowed to own buildings by a certain date. And then and they were able to make those sort of big changes and to shape the neighborhood at an architectural scale or at an urban planning scale. And some of the biggest, most famous Chinatowns, um, I think uh, there's a good section on it in the book On Gold Mountain by Lisa C. Um, for LA's Chinatown, um, where there were big urban planning projects that were organized by uh, the communities in Chinatowns to, to sort of uh, reshape um, the community uh, for different reasons. But thank you for the question. Uh, and then I... Um, I see, uh, thank you, Sahar, for bumping one up. Can you say a little bit more about the maps that you used uh, and how you related photographs and maps? I showed a couple glimpses of this. I do, 
I use a kind of, um, you know, you may have seen it like in K dramas or something, or just like thrillers where there's like just a big map with a lot of pictures pinned onto it and strings. So I have done that in real life, but mostly I'm doing that within um, Google presentations or, you know, some online software where I, I uh, import a map and I'll use most often a Sanborn insurance map, which the Library of Congress has a very comprehensive collection of. Those show each building's outline and things like the steps or sometimes materials they're made of um, or roofing. Uh, and then um, I'll overlay all the images I have in thumbnails as thumbnails. And then I'll try to figure out, I'll draw a line to where I think the photo was taken or what it represents. So that's sort of the, my process. Um, and then at some point when I begin modeling, I'll actually literally trace the outline of the footprint of the building and I'll kind of extrude it up and use that as the basis for the model. Um, and you can see that uh, in animated GIFs and in video in the modeling portion of the guide. Thank you. Um, I see Julie Chen has asked, as someone from who is originally from New York City, uh, I'd love to find out uh, where, if where I live now once had a Chinatown that no longer exists, uh, Rochester, New York, uh, for example, how would you recommend that I start? It's a, it's a, yeah, interesting and tough question. Um, I think when I started in Providence, I had that uh, website, uh, Rhode Island Chinese History dot com, R I Chinese History dot com, um, to start with. But then I, I just started web searching, you know, Providence Chinatown. Today, a lot of pictures that you'll find are actually pictures that I've made or I've found on my websites. But uh, at the time, there you would find a few from, you know, news articles or blogs where people had done prior research and surfaced some of these these pictures. But I think uh, pretty quickly, you know, in a lot of places, you know, you'll you'll hit a dead end or you won't find much. Um, I had a similar question. I grew up, uh, or when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time. I grew up for several years in, in New Haven, Connecticut, and I I've wondered. I don't. I still to this day don't know. Was there a Chinatown in New Haven? And going on, you know, Google or DuckDuckGo image search hasn't brought any images up that seem to answer that question. Or so I think my next step in that case, if I wanted to dig deeper, would be to go to some local libraries and archives and begin to look at material that hasn't been digitized or perhaps that is not showing up in a general image web image search, but but maybe you can search just the digital, you, you can search for images within a, a specific library or archives uh, website. You can also search the Library of Congress. So I think that's a, those are a bunch of places you can start. Um, and there is more on that process in the research portion of the guide that uh, we've linked to. Thank you. Yeah, you, you really have to get creative and, and look at a lot of sources. So I think that's a, that's a very good question. And I, and if you're interested, I'm also happy to connect with you to, to I don't know if that's uh, Julie Chen that, that I know. Maybe that's a different Julie Chen. But in either case, I'd be happy to connect with you and, and try to take those first few steps. Yeah. Oh, hey, Julie. <laughs> Thank you. Is there are there any others? I can reopen Q and A again. I don't see anything in there. Uh, and one other, Sidia Hartman, just to get at the question someone asked about, which was the Sidia Hartman piece that I mentioned. There, another one that's really incredible uh, that gets at specifically critical fabulation and speculative uh, work around uh, par partial and and uh, you know traumatic archives. Uh, is um, Wayward, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, which I'm currently in the middle of. Sorry, just typing that in there. Um, and it's, it's incredible. So uh, I, I strongly recommend that one too. All right. Well, thank you all so much for all your questions. I, I really appreciate them. And um, yeah, I hope to hear from, from you all again.